The French philosopher Derrida once said that a university is a place where everything can and should be thought. And I think um, writing is exactly the same kind of space. It's, it's a space where everything can and should be thought. The, the thing that literature can do, that fiction can do, that no other art form can do, um, film can't do it, painting can't do it, music can't do it, is to relish language, um, carefully, beautifully articulated language. I'm reminded of Oscar Wilde in his journal once um, wrote in the morning, uh, I took one comma out, and in the afternoon I put one comma back in. Um, that kind of love of language. Um, and then the other thing that literature can do, that fiction particularly can do, that other media, um, other genres can't, is to explore human consciousness. Um, when a film is presented to us, it's all about surface and speed. Um, so you never really are allowed to live for very long in anybody's mind in the film open a novel and you can actually live with somebody's consciousness for you know a week of your life, two weeks of your life. There's no other art form that actually does that, that explores human consciousness in a rich and in-depth way. And those, those two, so, and, and that, that has to do with characterization. So you know, language and character, I, I just, I fall into and adore. And, and then, okay, I'm lying, there's also a third thing, and that is, um, the idea of authorial imagination. I, I love to be taken places that I don't expect to be taken and surprised by conventions or, or you know, by, by formal moves that I haven't seen before. Um, I, I, I love to be dazzled. Tom Robbins has a great way um, of describing a sunset. A sunset's been described eight gazillion times in, in literature. Um, and um, he describes it in three words. It's indigo, indigoing, indigone. Um, and I just love that because it's just, it's this little linguistic surprise that makes us see the world differently. I absolutely adore trying to create texts and, and also reading texts, coming across texts that are unlike other texts I've ever seen. The French philosopher Derrida once said that a university is a place where everything can and should be thought. And I think um, writing is exactly the same kind of space. It's, it's a space where everything can and should be thought. And you, one shouldn't go into that space thinking I have certain responsibilities or I have to get across certain messages or I, I have to do certain things. Um, you should go where your writing leads you and, and hopefully that will lead you to these little moments of wonder. Um, I believe that. I also believe the diametrically opposite, which is that I think whether or not you feel like you have a responsibility, every writer who writes is, is, is getting across some kind of message, is communicating in some sort of way with his or her readership. And you have to be thinking about what that message is and, and essentially what you're teaching your readership about human experience about life, about how one lives, maybe how one should live, maybe how one shouldn't live, um, about something. And so I think uh, there needs to be a kind of self-consciousness that goes along with what a writer does and, and realize that what you're doing is ultimately going to have some kind of effect. Probably a much smaller one um, than the black blockbuster movie that came out last week, but it's going to affect some people and you have to think about how and why. Hemingway once said that writing is 99% uh, perspiration and 1% inspiration and I, I think that's really right. Once you get the idea for it, you think, I'm halfway there and then sort of three years later you're thinking, I only have a little ways to go, come on, we can do it. I'm a comp obsessive compulsive sort of person and so when I sit down to write, or when I, when I engage in a writing project, I always write for a certain amount of time every day. I sit there in my uh, writing studio and I will write for three to four hours a day no matter what happens. And nobody can call me, I don't check email, I don't do anything, I just like focus on the work that way. Um, seven days a week, as long as it takes to get, to get the work done. And then for the rest of the day, I'll either be doing research on it 
or I'll be reading other books just to sort of be swamped by language and character and interesting perspectives on, on how to engage in narrative, or I'll be traveling to do background research, uh, you know, that sort of thing, or I'll spend a couple hours a day totally cleansing the mind and getting away from this and taking a good hike in the country or something like that. But I'm very, very regimented. And, you know, Thomas Mann was once asked, how he um, wrote so much. He would just write these huge 700-page books um, all the time. And he said, well, you know, if you write two pages a day every day for a year, you have a novel. Um, and it does work out something like that. Now, he wrote a lot faster and better than I did. But if I can get a page a day done, um, I'll have a draft done by the end of the first year, and then probably two more drafts done in the course of the next year or two, and, and then it'll be ready to go. Yeah, uh, I do sometimes sit there and have absolutely nothing happen. I, I'll wait for the muse, and and the muse won't come, um, and I'll wait her out. You know, I'll it's like okay, fine, I can stay here as long as you you know can stay away, and and eventually she'll come. Or you know, you can kind of lure her out by simply starting to write um, without thinking about what you're going to write, without concentrating very much on the fact that I'm now working on a novel um, and just explore this little corner. Maybe it was a, a phrase you heard or maybe it was a character you wanted to start developing and suddenly it will open up into something. Um, so I, I seldom get through the whole four hours without the muse sort of at least, you know, giving me a nod and a wink at some point. <laughs> Stories come from everywhere and when you least expect them, um, I'll usually have a general idea of a story and I'll plot it out fairly carefully, giving myself permission the whole time to change the plot, to go different ways every day if I need to. And then I'll start writing, but I'm not quite sure how to get into it. I'm not quite sure, again, where it will sort of unfold for me. And so you just start and, and there's this, this incredibly tedious, it's arduous, it's hideous writing. You feel like you're writing this wooden, dead prose. And then all of a sudden, it'll just sort of unfold, or, or the character can just open up in some, some special way, and you go, I didn't even know that was my main character. What a, what a very interesting character. What's, and then you start asking yourself questions. It's, again, it's, writing's all about questions, not answers. And you say, what's that character's background? What does that character want most in life? Um, what, what is that character's strengths? What is that character's weaknesses? Um, what sorts of of interesting tics does that character have, either in the way he or she speaks or, or maybe the way that character dresses will tell us something about that character's education or that character's socioeconomic class. Um, and, then, and then writing's all about starting to juggle all those qualities, um, you know, and most of them are on fire, and, and suddenly you get this incredible act going. Um, but it, it, it comes to life just by asking the right questions. A novel that I've just finished came out uh, last week, I think, um, called Nietzsche's Kisses. And it's about Friedrich Nietzsche, his last mad night on earth um, in a bed in an attic in the middle of Weimar um, as he drifts from um, memory to hallucination to little snippets of, of reality. And Nietzsche was, you know, one of the most radical and influential of, of German philosophers. He's a guy who killed off God, who challenged everything that we once took for granted about language and experience and morality, um, and, and, and you know, was an incredibly powerful figure on the one hand, but on the other hand, he was used and abused. Um, he went mad for the last 10 years of his life, and his um, sister um, appropriated and rewrote his work um, to make him into the Nietzsche that that she wanted him to be. Um, the Anti-Semitic League in uh, Germany uh, appropriated his work and, and sort of torqued it in a way that, that made it say things that it, it didn't mean to be saying. Um, and the proto-Nazi uh, party uh, appropriated his work. And so, I mean, he's a, this fascinating sort of, sort of figure who has this fierce intelligence who's always struggling with problems. Um, and, and trying to think outside the box, trying to work against dogma. Um, and on the other hand, you know, he spent the last 10 years of his life um, virtually bedridden 
His sister kept him up in a little room um, in Weimar in, on the top floor of this building and would wheel him down uh, for dinners that she would hold for the heads of the Nazi party um, and the, the anti-Semitic league. Um, and, and he would sort of babble to himself and she would con these guys into thinking that he was really in touch with some sort of transcendental reality when in fact he was you know, mad as a hatter. I think that uh, what was wonderful about Nietzsche, Yeats said when he first came across Nietzsche that he got drunk on Nietzsche. And I think the reason one gets drunk on Nietzsche, I did too, I came across him in an uh, undergraduate philosophy course in existentialism 25 years ago, 27 years ago, and um, just, just fell all over myself. And then I had this huge dormant period for, of about 20 years. I was walking by the bookshelf one day and saw Nietzsche sitting there and thought, oh, I'll, I'll just see if he sort of holds up. And there I was drunk again. Um, and I think the reason is because what Nietzsche does is he fastens on like a pit bull um, to dogma and just rips it apart to try to understand why we believe what we believe, how we believe what we believe. Um, do you really want to believe that? Do you really want to believe that's good and that's evil, that there are such simplistic sort of words as good and evil that apply to our experience? Um, that's the kind of moral obligation that a writer has, is to challenge uh, received notions of, of morality or to, receive, uh, to challenge received notions of dogma. Um, and uh, what we're supposed to believe and how we're supposed to believe it. Always ask questions. The writer's goal in, in, in society or, or position in society is the one who asks the questions. I really think that the, the most profound writing through the centuries, and I'm not just talking about you know, so-called postmodern writing or so-called innovative writing, but the writing that has survived you know, the last 2,500 years of Western culture isn't the writing that gives the answers. It's the writing that asks the right questions, um, that gets us all thinking. Um, it doesn't tell us to stop thinking, here's the answer. It tells us to start thinking, here are the questions. And what more could you ask from any kind of art? Thomas Mann has a quote uh, about, uh, and it's a lovely quote about writing novels, and, and he says that uh, writers have a kind of difficulty writing um, that other people don't, and that in fact you can tell a writer because he or she's the one um, who has difficulty writing. Um, I think most people don't find writing all that complicated. They sit down, they do what they have to do. Um, writing is kind of difficult when you're doing it for a living and you're trying to create these sort of verbal constructs, um, every one of them being perfect. Um, and uh, so, so it's, it's sort of a difficult process, but I, I love it, and with Nietzsche, it was a, a process that took about maybe two years or so, and in addition to, to the careful writing part, um, I also went over to Europe and, and traced his sort of life steps from Germany to Switzerland and into to Italy to see where he lived, how he lived, what kind of details I could get. Went into the Nietzsche archives in uh, Weimar and looked at how his sister had altered his texts, had written uh, letters in his name, um, you know, just incredible stuff, saw the, the room that he died in. Um, all of that sort of stuff goes into the research for writing the novel. I would suggest to, to beginning writers a couple things. First of all, if you want to write um, for fame or money, do something else. Um, your chances of actually making an extended living um, out of writing well, put it this way, your chances of winning the lottery are probably better. Um, so, so go into it because you love it. Go into it because you love words, the power of language, the joy of exploring characters. You know, fiction is one of the great sort of travel literatures where you get to actually travel into the consciousness of characters who aren't you. I mean, what a fascinating way to spend your life, okay? You're not going to make a lot of money on it, but who cares? Um, and then in, in more practical terms, what I would say is... Um, and this strikes young writers as, as counterintuitive, but don't worry so much about writing as reading. Just read, read, read as widely as you can. If you like horror, um, don't just read horror. Read everything around it. Read science fiction, read memoir, read um, you know, romance, read literary fiction, read everything that you can. 
any writer you hear about. That's how you're going to learn your craft. Um, w writing workshops are good. I, I, I teach them. I've been students in them. But what's really important is um, sitting down at the page after you've read all this stuff and struggling through it. And then that's the other side. And the, la the last thing I would uh, um, give as a bit of advice to, to young writers is it's real easy to talk about writing. It's really hard to do it. And think of writing as you would learning the piano or, or, or preparing for the Olympics. Nobody who's an Olympic skater would say, you know what, I have an extra hour once every couple weeks, so I think maybe I'll go out and skate a little bit. And I should be pretty well ready for the Olympics in three years. Um, but somehow, beginning writers think, yeah, yeah I'll, write, I'll write a story um, this year, and, and that shouldn't be too hard. Um, it's you, you, every day you have to write a little bit. You have to, you know, form your muscles, and you have to build your stamina, and you have to fall a lot, and you have to try lots of things. And it's in that process that you begin to really learn how to write and, and what to write. I, I'm not one to say, you know, a narrative is necessarily bad or good. But I do think that you were trained as a reader over time to read, to, to believe certain things because you've heard them so many times. And I, I think what's important is to ask ourselves about those stories, the very stories that we've heard so many times that we come to take them for granted uh, as truth. Um, and that the more we can break through those and, and think outside those boxes, I think the richer people will be and, and um, um, the more, you know, philosophically and narratively interesting they'll be. So it's really weird when your novel first comes out and you're waiting for what the critics are going to say because there's this incredible stillness. You can hear a pin drop for a couple weeks and then the first reviews come out. Now the first reviews are just coming out about Nietzsche's kisses. I just have seen the first couple. And so far so good, but you know, you never know. It, 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 it's like just tiptoeing among them. Um, and I'm one of those writers uh, that loves to read the reviews. I, there's something deep and dark inside me um, that wants to see what other people have to say about it. And so I'm, I'm always sort of ferreting them out and reading them and trying to figure out, you know, what's what. And then totally paralyzing myself for six months before I can write anything else. <laughs> I try not to let reviews affect me. Um, um, I'm just, I'm intrigued because, again, I think it goes back to my interest in how readers read and what they focus on in a work, uh, in a work and, and how they engage with the work. And I just, I love the idea of, you know, here's this one consciousness, the consciousness of the writer, and then this other consciousness of the critic sort of engages with that and, and thinks about it out loud. And I'm just fascinated by w how a critic will focus on this element in the novel and not that element. Um, focus on that character or, or that scene. And, you know, everybody when they read a novel really reads a different novel um, because of the background they bring to it, because of their attention and where it goes in a novel, because of what they love about a novel or don't love about a novel. Um, and so I just love to see that. I love to see how they, they engage. I don't have an approach to my work, and I'm not looking for a specific approach. And in fact, I think I'm most interested in just the variety of approaches that there are. Uh, sometimes, uh, you know, a, a student will approach me or uh, a critic will approach me and, and present me with a, a reading of my work that I've never seen before. And, and that's fascinating, I mean, that I haven't thought of. And it's like, that's a, that's a miraculous moment. The problem with me as a writer is according to the critics, um, is that I don't write the same kind of book twice. So as you can tell, you know, here's a historical novel about Friedrich Nietzsche. Here's a hypertext, um, hypermedia piece about, you know, the Mall of America and this, this theater inside of it. Um, and, and so my demographic actually sort of changes from one novel to another. Um, I think the only kind of core... Um, readership I have is a readership that picked up on me, oh, you know, 10, 15 years ago when my first book came out and has sort of 
has the same frame of mind about, oh, I wonder what Olson's going to do next. Is he going to do, you know, science fiction or is he going to do historical fiction, or whatever. And, and my whole idea in life is to never step into the same narrative stream twice. You know, there, there's, it would seem to me so tedious to write the same book over and over again. But a lot of writers do exactly that. They find their demographic, they find their, their sort of narrative structure that works for them, and then they just do it over and over and over again. Um, you know, I think if I die and I haven't been good in life and I go to hell, that'll be the part of hell that I inhabit, having to write the same story over and over again for infinity. It'd be, it would be hideous. <laughs> I would most love my writing to be able to do is to um, plant the seeds of questions in, in my readers that they haven't thought about before. Or, or again, see a question in a way that you haven't seen it before. One of the things that Nietzsche's Kisses is about, um, we talked about Nietzsche and his background and so on, but it's also about how somebody dies. And it's about this guy who's lived his life one way um, and then enters his final hours. As, as you know, we're all going to at some point, and yet, as a culture, we don't want to think about it too hard. And thinking about it for, you know, 250 pages about how we do that um, and, and what must be going through our heads as, as we do that. I mean, what, a, what an amazing set of questions that gives rise to. And um, if I can in any way spark those kinds of questions and the feelings that come from them in my readers in the same way that I felt sparked and engaged with the questions as I was writing it. It's like, I'm there. It doesn't, it doesn't get any better than that. For me, what literature is all about in a society is its heart and its mind. Um, again, it goes back to this idea that asking profound questions, there's a space in our culture to do that, and it's called fiction, and it's called literature. And, and asking them in, in haunting um, ways that you can't shake. I mean, we've all had this experience. It's, it's the most magnificent experience in the world of having read a book and not being able to get that book out of our mind, either the characters or the idea that the, the book was investigating, or some gorgeous phrase um, where you went, I didn't know our language could do that. Um, that's the space that literature inhabits. It's, it's the stuff that you know, drills a hole in your heart um, and, and you know, blows up your mind in, in ways that you just can't fathom and gets you to think about stuff you didn't even think was important to think about. Um, you know, like life, like death, like how you want to live, um, you know, like who you are and, 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 you know, where you're going. I mean, those aren't questions that come in, in you know, cheap movies or, or pop songs. Um, and so I think people have spoken about the death of the novel for, for 50 years, you know, and, and the sort of flavor of the week now in the literary world is the memoir and, and the, the nonfiction piece. But it seems to me that the reason a novel isn't going to die anytime soon, be it because of hypermedia or because of, of memoir, is because it explores a very special part of what it is to be human. And no other art form quite explores language and consciousness in the way that novels do.